What's up guys, it's Jace Two Cents here and it's launch day for Intel Z370 chipset, which means both companies have pretty much all their cards on the table from the bottom of their stack to the top. And so it makes it a very good time as a buyer to build a system. You're pretty safe right now that nothing new in top tier or even mid-level is gonna be getting launched anytime soon because both sides have already just shoved all of their products to market. 2017 was a really exciting year for PC builders or PC enthusiasts because you have so much hardware to consider that makes sense on both sides of the fence. Now disclaimer, because I have to put this out there, otherwise people come up with their own like really stupid ideas of how these videos work. Yes, Intel sent me the CPU, but so did AMD. Neither of these companies sent me any cash for any reason or even gave me any input whatsoever on how this video should be made. This is 100% my idea and my test methodology and my opinions. I don't know why that's so hard for people to understand, but now that that's out of the way, let's talk about this. We've got the 8700K over here and that's a, that, it's an interesting CPU for Intel because it's the first time they've put six cores and 12 threads on their mainstream CPU. We've seen that plenty of times on the extreme, right? X58, X79, X99, X299. So we've got right here are two test benches I made. Well, they're just boxes, right? They made, they made perfectly good test benches. One is Z370 featuring an 8700K. One is an AX370 Gaming 5 from uh, Oris, which is also Gigabyte, featuring a 1700X. Now, why did I put the 8700K versus the 1700X? Because there's a lot of weird ways I could have done this video because this is a $359 CPU. The problem is AMD doesn't have a $359 CPU. They have a $200 CPU, a $300 CPU, and a $400 CPU. So it's kind of like the whole AMD versus Nvidia thing where they're constantly like leapfrogging each other. I could have gone core for core, which means I'd be putting the 8700K versus the Ryzen 1600X. This comes in at just over $200. This comes in at $359. This is the clear winner in terms of bargain and price to performance, but still has good performance. See, back in the day, AMD was always, well, they're the performance per dollar king where you could spend you know, money on an FX platform and it would just get smashed by anything Intel had to offer past the Ivy Bridge series. And uh, your, your argument was, yeah, but it didn't cost a lot. Well, now you're actually getting really good performance and it still doesn't cost a lot compared to the Intel variant. I still feel like the 1700X is still a really good sweet spot in terms of the X370 platform, but you could save even more money by going with a 1700. The difference is I don't have to overclock this one as far as I would a 1700. And unfortunately my 1700 is kind of a dud. It doesn't overclock very well. So that's why I came up with this methodology. But if you want to talk about how weird things are in the state of affairs right now, you can get the $359 Z370 um, 8700K, or you could get the $359, according to Amazon anyway, the $359 i7-7800K, or X, whatever it is. I think, they're, I think it's a K-SKU, but it's also a six core 12 thread on the X platform. So it's just weird that you could have a six core and a 12 core on both platforms simultaneously. Yes, I know it's, actually it's happened before with quad cores, but this is the first time it's kind of happened with six core. All right, enough's enough. We're gonna do one test live, which is Cinebench. Then I'm gonna run through all of my tests, overclock it, and then run through my test again so that you can see exactly what you get for your money on both sides. One other thing to point out too is this is not a stacked test where I've got an air cooler on the AMD build and I've got a water cooler on the Intel build. If you guys have been following any of this and you know that Intel runs hot. 7700K was hot, the latest CPUs on the X platform, the X299 stuff is hot because they stopped soldering and they're using thermal interface material between the heat spreaders now. And temperatures were my limiting factor of how far I could overclock this on air. But temperatures were not what was limiting Ryzen. Ryzen's architecture is what was limiting Ryzen. So I still had headroom in temperatures, lots of it left over over here on the air cooler where the Intel, I had no choice but to take the air cooler off and put on water just to keep it under control. So we're at stock speeds right now. And we're just gonna do R15 first. Eight core, 16 thread versus six core, 12 thread. Let's see if I can time this. Three, two, one, go. They're at stock speeds. This one boosted up to 4.7. That one's sitting at 3.5. Looks like it went up to 3.8 for a second, but came back down to 3.5. But it certainly looks like, well, it's hard to tell who's winning, to be, to be honest. It's got a massive clock differential though. It's almost a gigahertz faster over here than over there. 
So we got a 1527 versus a 1559. So both of those scores, that's that's what that's negligible. Negligible. You're not going to notice a real world difference, but that's just one test, right? Um, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to go through quite a few tests, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about them. So at stock speeds, it should be no surprise that the 8700K bested the 1700X. I mean, one, it's more expensive. Even though the 1700X has more cores, core count isn't everything. Um, there's a few reasons why it won at stock test, and we'll talk about this because if you're running a Ryzen system, there's some things you need to be aware of. One, make sure your system is running high performance mode on the Ryzen. Uh, you know, power options go into high performance. That's important. Of course, we were set there, um, but the 8700K is running anywhere between 900 megahertz to a gigahertz, a whole gigahertz faster than the Ryzen system. And a lot of this stuff, core speed is king versus core count. And as we move into these high core count CPUs, it's gonna take time for programs starting to catch up again. It's kind of this leapfrog thing, right? Where high core count, I say high core count, dual core and quad core CPUs came out about a decade ago, and then programs had to catch up and then they caught up. And now we have more cores, but the programs still aren't leveraging all those cores, so the core speed matters a lot. That's one other thing too you need to be aware of if you're running a Ryzen system, and that is memory speed. It's no surprise that memory speed matters with Ryzen. This has been tested over and over and over, but if you just build the system out, right, and you boot into your BIOS, check this out. Our frequency, as you can see, is running on the memory at 2144, technically 2133. And the problem is that the default base clock speed of DDR4 is 2133. Even like these sticks of RAM I have in here right here are 3000 megahertz dims on both sides. But both, both of these systems are running at 2133 because that's the base clock. So a lot of people will build up their system, put it together and just boot it and leave it because they're like, oh, I don't want to overclock, I'm afraid. But then they buy this fast RAM and they don't realize that they're running at the base clock. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to go ahead and overclock um, I have actually got a profile. This is a 3.9 gigahertz overclock profile. We're also running at 2933 on the megahertz. That's a, uh, on the memory. That's a big deal. I couldn't actually get it to post anything faster, unfortunately. Ryzen does like fast memory. So if you can get that above 3000, you're only gonna benefit yourself. But we're gonna go ahead and boot that. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm also gonna go into the Intel system and I'm gonna overclock this. Now I had a choice I had to make with this. My chip is capable of, of 5.2 gigahertz uh, with a lot of volts and gets kind of hot. 5.1 is capable with, a, with an AIO. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run five gigs because again, I'm not sure, that's a very clicky keyboard, right? Get into the BIOS, okay. I'm not sure if I was sent to cherry pick CPU. So I'm not gonna run the max capable of what I can get on this, although I'm seeing reports of most people hitting five gigahertz or, or beyond and up to 3,600 megahertz on the memory. What I'm gonna do is I'm trying to pick something more middle of the ground because, and what you're gonna notice with, with the Ryzen here, by the way, is it power cycles three times whenever I apply this overclock. So it's, it's kind of picky, but it will, it will work. Anyway, come back over here. So just like I mentioned, we're running at 2133, even though we have 3,000 megahertz sticks of RAM in there. This is really easy to overclock. It's just put in a multiplier. So in this case, I put in 50. RAM is running at 3,200 megahertz. And then we've got um, CPU voltage. I'm running at 1.360. I can actually run that at 1.35 because that was for my voltage for the 5.1. So we're just gonna leave that. DRAM voltage is good. Other than that, that's the only settings we change with the exception of I'm gonna also, nope, you know what? We're fine, that's it. So that's all we change. Multiplier, RAM speed, voltage. Just those three things. And you can achieve five gigs on 8700K pretty easily. Something else you'll also notice though is I am running the air cooler over here at 
I've got Vardar fans on there, which are high static pressure fans. We've got a ton of air moving there. I can feel the air all the way back here. That's why we're not having any cooling issues on air, even though, as you can see right here, come on, we are overclocked to 3.9 gigahertz. It says 3.89, but it is overclocked 3.9. And over here on the Intel system, as you can see, we are running 4.96 or technically five gigs. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna run through all those tests again and see what happens to the comparative results when overclocking is applied, especially memory, because we only went up 500 megahertz on the Ryzen system. We went up about 300 megahertz. No, yeah, about 300 megahertz on the Intel system. So not a huge jump in terms of both, but the memory speed was a big deal on both. So as expected, overclocking both CPUs got us higher scores, but we still had a pretty, you know, consistent interval between both CPUs. Uh, but I still think, you know, I can't, this isn't one of those videos where I can say, here's a clear winner because it really depends on what you're doing. The platforms are not created equal, right? There's still some issues with RAID and Ryzen, and although AMD is making good strides in getting more native RAID support on Ryzen, you're still gonna get a more fluid experience, I think, on the Intel platform with things like RAID support, um, VRock and Optane, I mean, that's that's kind of a hard sell. I, I don't know of anyone that would necessarily run out and buy Intel specifically because of those things. But uh, there's a couple of things I wanna talk about here. The, the, the Premier render, obviously it favors core clock, right? Core clock, we've known this for a while. You add more cores, Adobe doesn't care too much. You add core speed, man, does it go through the roof. It's one of the reasons why the 7960X I'm using upstairs right now when I do my rendering with 16 cores and 32 threads is really not any faster than my 7900X, which was a 10 core, 20 thread. So yeah, it just doesn't make that much of a difference. It's, it has everything to do with speed. Then the same thing kind of goes with the 1080 Ti's as well, where we actually saw in both systems, when you overclock the CPU, you get better scores in things like Tomb Raider and 3D Mark and all of that, because even though CPUs are fast, man, the, the top of the line GPUs, they're still so fast where even something like an 8700K is, I really don't want to call it bottlenecking but there was an improvement to be had by increasing the core speed of the chip. One of the things I've kind of noticed though, as I've been playing around with the 8700K, comparing it to CPUs I've gotten to look at in the past, like the 7700 and the 6700K, is we saw a huge jump in this generation, not only in the core count, but also core speed, right? Five gigahertz was kind of the magic number, like, oh my God, five gigahertz is never gonna ha happen on the current processor, or the current silicon. It's not gonna be capable of five gigs. And suddenly now we're seeing five gigs with no problem. Now, it makes me honestly feel like that it's, the industry was indeed holding out, or at least Intel was. I mean, it kind of seems that way. We're seeing five gigs, six cores, 12 threads, no problem whatsoever. Heck, even my 7980XE almost hit five gigs, 4.9, no problem. So at the end of the day, either, either side really has compelling arguments on which CPU platform you should go with. AMD is more relevant today than it's ever been relevant enough to where you're seeing the kind of improvement increase in one generation like you just saw right here with intel pulled in sooner than the original roadmap because now we have competition in the space so i'm not going to sit here and say you should buy intel or you should buy amd the ryzen system is still one of my favorites at this price point because this is $60 less than that so that really makes this kind of look like a, a real competitor when yeah, sure, it was being beaten by the 8700K, but it should have been. That's a more expensive CPU. And you get more cores here to play around with if you are looking at doing things like virtual machines, uh, if you just wanna do anything that requires core count over core speed, then maybe this is the more compelling option. But the, end, the point of this video wasn't to walk in here and say, buy this one, buy this one right here. Although you can, you know, Amazon links and stuff, description below. Um, it, there's too many variables to say which one's right for you. What I will say though, is it's exciting that we finally have 
compelling platforms on both sides. That's the reason why this exists today. Don't forget, this exists today because this did so well. Otherwise, you'd still be waiting till 2018 for that. So market competition happened, and we have a direct result now, where now hopefully AMD can answer because that's what needs to happen. Anyway guys, thanks for watching today's video. Um, let me know what kind of tests you think we should do on CPU. CPU is a hard thing to test. GPUs are easy, run your games, compare them. But CPUs are kind of tough, there's a lot of different workloads. So let me know what you guys think I should include in this, and when we do the 8400, I'll make sure to include that. Anyway guys, thanks for watching today's video. As always, I'll see you in the next one.